please join me in praying the Collect for Mission. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and use our gifts to make a difference. each other 
after the consecration of Gene Robinson as the first openly gay bishop in 2003. We are in a very different place on this issue in 2022. We now have official rights for same-sex marriage. We have LGBTQ bishops. The bishops of the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada made it known that they were not pleased with the substance of this call and the way it was tucked into the agenda. And they stood up for the full inclusion of our LGBTQ people. And it looks like the Lambeth leadership has taken it under advisement. Changes have been made. The bishops have agreed to disagree. Many Episcopal bishops affirm that Lambeth is supposed to create community and dialogue and not make legislative decisions. My classmate at CDSP, Bishop Betsy Monat of Iowa, wrote, I believe this is what is best about the Anglican Communion. We have no overarching legislative body that can declare an absolute position on any point of doctrine or polity. Instead, we are bound together because we chose, we choose to remain in relationship, even in the face of our deep disagreements. As I read posts about Lambeth this week, I was reminded of the messiness of church governance and church history. The Anglican Communion itself exists because of the Church of England's presence in the colonies of the British Empire including, going back to the 18th century, the American church. As much as I've always been an Anglophile, I realize that the Anglican Communion has its roots in colonialism. The church has always been a flawed enterprise run by human beings in all our human imperfections. As we saw this last week, Pope Francis went to Canada explicitly to apologize to Native peoples for the church's abuse of indigenous children in the church boarding schools, a horrific chapter in church history. In our readings today, we heard a passage from Ecclesiastes that is an essential cry and lament over the futility, it seems, of human endeavors. And at times, the history of the church can seem like that, all vanity. <clears throat> we also heard Jesus tell the parable of the rich fool. And in some ways, the historical church has been a bit like the rich fool. Over the centuries, it has often stored up riches and power for itself. In our gospel today, Jesus says it's more important to be rich towards God than rich in possessions. What does he mean? Our reading from Colossians has much to tell us about being rich towards God. First, it reminds us of our baptism. Paul writes about dying with Christ, and that is what being submerged in the waters of baptism symbolizes. And we also rise with him into a new life in Christ. When we seek to align ourselves with Christ-like values in our daily lives, we can live into our baptism, and we can become rich towards God. Secondly, Paul says to put away whatever is earthly, and he has a long list of, like, the seven deadly sins. And he includes greed, which he calls idolatry. Again, by aligning ourselves with Christ-like values, we turn away from things like greed and idolatry, and we can become rich towards God and accept God's grace. In our gospel passage, we see the rich fool only thinking about himself when he has the abundant harvest. How can he hold on to it all for himself? Notice how he only talks to himself, too. He's not connected to the wider community. He doesn't ask how he could share his treasure with others or put it aside for the community in a famine like Joseph did in Egypt. Paul also says, in Christ there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But 
Christ is all and in all. Paul points to being in communion. Perhaps richness, richness in God means living in connection with each other and seeing ourselves as members of a wider community in Christ. Perhaps richness in God means caring about each other and striving for equity and inclusion of all God's people. This sounds a lot like the church and the Anglican Communion on a good day, and it strives as it strives to become rich towards God. We have to continually renew our relationships with each other and with God to make the church rich towards God. The good news is that for the next 10 days or so, the 650 bishops from around the world are talking with each other and creating a web of friendships and dialogue across cultures. This can only lead the Anglican communion to be richer towards God. The good news is there are now 97 female bishops in the Anglican communion up from 18 in 2008 and only 8 in 1998, showing that the worldwide Anglican movement is growing in richness towards God. The good news is that here at St. Paul's, we are sponsoring three members of the Tongan congregation in the ordination process. And you have called your first female rector in Sarah Stewart. Here in our corner of the Anglican Communion, I think we are growing in richness towards God. All of this points to a generosity of spirit and trust in God's love. All of this points to being rich in God. There is a meme that has bounced around the internet recently that says, when the harvest is large, don't build bigger barns, build a bigger table. Being rich in God teaches us to build that bigger table for people who are hungry for God's love and to share it with them. Let us remember and pray for the larger table being set around the Anglican Communion as we come to Christ's table and receive the richness of God's love for us.